Tonight I'm going to talk about the argument I make in this new book, The End of America. And I'm just going to speak from my heart about what I see happening right now and what we need to do about it. And I kind of want to issue a bit of a, a not a warning, but almost like a, you know, like those rides you go on in Disneyland where, you know, if they're very turbulent, you, you get a heads up. It, it's, a, it's a very difficult message. In some ways, I'm going to take you on a difficult journey, but I want to reassure you that we're going to come out to sunshine and, and hope, if not sunshine, certainly hope, on the other side. So the book, this is why I wrote the book. I wrote the book for an older person and for a younger person in my life. Um, the older person is a mentor of mine who is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And we would sit around chatting about news events. And she kept saying, they did this in Germany. They did this in Germany. And at, you know, at that time, I thought that this was a nutty thing to say, really extreme, really rhetorical. And I just disregarded it. But she kept saying, they did this in Germany. They did it in Germany. And she wasn't talking about the later years, uh, National Socialist outcomes. She was talking about the early years, 1930, 1931, 1932, when Germany was a modern parliamentary democracy, a fragile one. But it would have been very recognizable to us. Germany in the early 30s had pop stars and Bauhaus architecture and Paris fashion and civil rights organizations, gay rights organizations, sex education organizations, uh, you know, page six writers, you know, gossip columnists. And it was a democracy. And so she was talking about the very early pressures on a democracy, legal pressures on a democracy, by people who were intent on closing down that democracy. And, you know, I, I kept sort of brushing this off, but finally she sat me down and she gave me a stack of books and she almost physically said, you know, read. And I started reading. And honestly, my hair stood on end because I saw that she was right, she wasn't being rhetorical at all. That in fact, not only were there tactical echoes from the past, but that what I was seeing was actual scenes recurring, imagery recurring, language, sound bites recurring in modern events in America. So then I began reading even more about uh, how societies, how democracies close down or how would-be despots crack down on the democracy movement. So I read about Italy in the 20s, and all, as always, Mussolini was the great innovator. He sort of pioneered this technology of closing down a modern democracy. Um, I read about Germany in the 30s, as I mentioned, about Russia in the 30s, about East Germany in the 50s, Czechoslovakia in the 60s, Pinochet's coup in Chile, and I read about the Chinese crackdown on the democracy movement at the end of the 80s. And what became completely clear to me is that every would-be despot, every would-be dictator, whether they're on the left or the right, does the same 10 things. There's a blueprint to closing down an open society or crushing a democracy movement. And that, you know, Mussolini kind of drafted this blueprint and then Hitler studied Mussolini, Stalin studied Hitler, Hitler studied Stalin. The great dictators all kind of perfected it from one another. But then the petty dictators all over the world in the latter part of the 20th century, beginning of this century, reproduced the blueprint. We teach the blueprint at the School for the Americas. We teach the blueprint. So that if you remember Thailand last spring, in, you know, in one week it was a democracy, a week later it was a military dictatorship. And it was like they were going through a checking, a, a shopping list in the way they were. That was the blueprint. You see Burma, Myanmar, you know, two weeks ago, because I know the blueprint, I was looking at my watch. Today they're marching the street. In 48 hours they're going to be shooting on the monks protesting. In a week they're going to be uh, suspending communications. The blueprint is predictive. And what was even more chilling to me and this is where I really have to applaud you for coming here on a Thursday night when you could be watching America's Next Top Model <laughs> and, and listening to this. Um, it's very brave of you. Uh, what became clear to me is that each of these 10 steps, these 10 classic steps 
that every would-be dictator puts in place are underway right now in the United States. I also had to write this book when I realized that because of a younger person in my life, two people actually, Jennifer Gandon and Chris Lee. She's a wonderful 28-year-old a student that I mentored, a writer, and she was marrying Chris, who's a wonderful 28-year-old activist. And knowing the storm clouds that were gathering around this young couple, I realized that, you know, I had to do more than just get them something from Crate and Barrel, you know, um, that I had to give them something that would help them in a time like this. And so I, I wrote the book really for them, as well as for my, my older friend, because what it is is a kind of refresher, a reminder to Americans, we don't tend to think about history a lot, I don't either, you know, about how societies closed down in the past, a blueprint, and also a refresher uh, about what democracy is and how to sustain it at a time when it's under assault. Um, so that's why I wrote this book. And actually, Chris's own story is kind of very moving to me because his mom, was 28 herself when she took the four-month-old Chris in her arms and fled Vietnam to get into a boat and sail across the ocean as a refugee, as a boat person, to arrive in this country because she understood liberty the way the founders understood liberty. You know, it's, it's an understanding we've kind of forgotten, we've gotten lazy about. She understood that it was worth risking her life and her child's life to raise her baby in liberty, in freedom. So, that's the kind of consciousness we have to remember now in order to fight back against the kind of pressures that I'll be describing. So what are these 10 steps? And by the way, before I tell you the 10 steps, I just want to like invoke something that was kind of amazing to me to discover. You know, like civics is so boring, right? When you, how many of you took civics? in middle school or high school? Show of hands. That's pretty good, but it's still like half of the audience, and this is a you know, self-selected, engaged audience. You know, people don't take civics anymore. It's, it's not mandatory anymore. So there's this whole generation coming up that really doesn't know what democracy is. But what we're not taught, you know, we're sort of given this like hallmark card view of the mood the founders were in when they drafted the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, it's like freedom, you know, confident, expansive. That is not true. When you go back and read the founding, the founding fathers, I mean, there were mothers too, but they were disenfranchised. Um, <laughs> took a while for, you know, us to get included. Um, you see that they were writing in a, 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 a state of dread and fear because the founders knew in their bones that an American despot could easily arise in America to oppress Americans. They knew it. They knew it from their own experience. They had fled, or their parents had fled, countries where, like in England, Tom Paine was tried for sedition, for writing the rights of man. He could have been hanged by the crown for writing that, that book. Um, you know, countries where Quakers were tortured by the state for their beliefs. That's why they came to Philadelphia. And so the founders, you know, in their hearts and their lived experiences knew what tyranny was. And so they wanted to create a place where you were safe from that kind of oppression. And that's why they set their, our system of checks and balances as they did. Checks and balances, what a boring term, right? I mean, we are not taught that this system is this sexy, passionate, amazing, inspiring concept, this radical vision of human self-determination. Um, but they knew without a doubt that it was human nature to abuse power if power was unchecked. And that that was why these checks and balances were so important. So what are these 10 steps that so profoundly assault the founder's vision and put us at risk? The first thing every would-be dictator does is to invoke a terrifying internal and external threat. And very often this threat can be real and they'll hype it or use it manipulatively. For example, Stalin 
talked about sleeper cells. Who's heard that term in the last six years? R right? Right. Now, had you heard that term in the 80s or 90s? I hadn't. What are sleeper cells? Stalin said sleeper cells are capitalist agents, meaning us, capitalist terrorists, who were dressing like Soviet citizens, acting like Soviet citizens, hiding among good Soviet citizens sneakily, waiting for the moment, perhaps for years, when at a signal they would rise up and create anti-Soviet terrorist mayhem, right? So this was a hyped threat, didn't exist. It's a narrative that recurs, and, and what you'll see in, in you know, what I'm sharing with you is that it's almost like someone in the Bush administration has gone back and seen what worked and just basically lifted those images, those, that language, homeland, Heimat, right? Um, embedding of journalists, Goebbels pioneered the embedding of journalists, Lenny Riefenstahl was embedded with troops going into Poland. Um, you know, take a look at Mission Accomplished and take a look at the scene in Triumph of the Will where the Fuhrer is descending in a plane and greeted by his uh, uniformed staffers and he says, you know, we need your support in accomplishing our mission. So many echoes. I mean, I started feeling this feeling of deja vu when I was like, okay, people are burning Dixie Chick CDs. CDs don't burn, you know? <laughs> they like emit toxic smoke, you know? Why is this so familiar? And of course, Goebbels in 1933 staged spontaneous gatherings of students where they burned books. And again and again, you see these echoes. Um, but, so Stalin's was a hyped threat, but but Pinochet told Chileans in 1973 about a real threat. There were really armed insurgents. But then he hyped it with fake documents, which is something despots often do. And remember, we saw fake documents when the White House showed the yellow cake documents that there's a whole book saying everyone's like, no, they're fake, they're fake. But they said, oh, Niger is buying uranium. I'm sorry, um, Iraq is buying uranium from Niger. We can't wait for the smoking gun to come in the form of a mushroom cloud, and so we were duped into invading Iraq. So, similarly, Pinochet held up what he called Plan Z, fake documents that purported to show that these armed insurgents were going to um, blow up all this infrastructure and assassinate all these leaders at once. Fake, but it terrified Chilean citizens so that they didn't fight hard for their democracy when the coup was attempted. The second thing a would-be despot always does is to create a secret prison system where torture takes place that is outside the rule of law. And very often, they will also establish military tribunals that strip prisoners of due process. Again, Lenin was the innovator this time, but Mussolini studied Lenin and developed his system called Confino, Hitler studied Stalin and developed the people's court system. I beg your pardon, Hitler studied Mussolini with the people's court system and Stalin studied Hitler. And so what happens when you have a military tribunal system and a secret prison system outside the rule of law where torture takes place is that it starts to put pressure on the rest of civil society. And I'll tell you how. Now this is really difficult. But this is like, I've started to like offer $50,000 for anyone who can do this, even though I don't happen to have $50,000 handy. But um, I invite you to name a society that created a secret prison system outside the rule of law where torture takes place that didn't sooner or later turn the abuse against its own citizens. So why should we worry about the fact that brown people with Muslim names on this far-off island are being tortured. The White House says we don't torture, it's a lie. They're being tortured, systemically. People in US-held prisons in Iraq are being tortured. People at black sites are being tortured. Why should it bother us? I mean, apart, I mean, my brother's a really decent guy, but he said, you know, that's not my issue before he read my argument. And so apart from the moral issue, why should we worry that the state has legalized torture? The reason we should worry is that in what I call a fascist shift, and I use that term very conservatively, I use it technically, not rhetorically. I, there are many definitions of fascism. 
my dictionary definition is when the state starts to use terror against the individual in an effort to push back democracy. So we should worry about the fact that the state has essentially legalized torture of these marginal people, people who are marginal to us, because what always happens in a fascist shift is that the state will start by abusing people that no one in the mainstream really identifies with much. You know, in, in Germany, it was anarchists, communists, homosexuals, Jews, gypsies, thank you. And then what always happens is there's a blurring of the line and the, the, the noose starts to catch up more and more members of civil society, mainstream society, and it's always the same cast of characters. Us, basically. Um, journalists, editors, opposition leaders, labor leaders, and outspoken clergy. So, we, sh you know, and, and Germany is so instructive in this regard because, you know, people don't realize that it didn't start with crematoria. You know, that what happens when you create a secret prison system where torture takes place is it always metastasizes, starts out little and informal and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And like in, in Berlin in 1931, 1932, torture was still illegal. The Nazis weren't even in power. They were a minority uh, party. It was still a democracy. There were opposition, there were marches, there was, you know, everything was, was as it, it should have been. But the SA, a paramilitary force, we'll get to that, started to create these makeshift torture cellars where they would torment these marginal people. And everyone knew about it. They thought it was funny. If there were cartoons about it in the German press, it's like, you know, that show 24. It's like, that's funny. Everyone accepted it. But then it doesn't take too long before the line starts to be blurred. So why is this so urgently relevant to us? Most Americans don't realize that the president now claims the power to say to any one of us, what's your name? Raul. Raul, you're an enemy combatant. Or let's find someone who really looks like a soccer mom, a Republican soccer mom, okay? <laughs> I, I, Republican, you have a really nice purse. Republican soccer mom. Yes, yes. Pardon me? Anne, enemy combatant. No, it doesn't matter. You can be innocent. You can be Republican. You can be a devoted, you know, evangelical. It doesn't matter. Enemy combatant is a status offense. Your innocence does not protect you. Your party affiliation does not protect you. And if he says, and Naomi, enemy combatant, it's like Mother May I. If he, on his say so alone, he can name you or me an enemy combatant, and they can't torture us yet, but they can take us to a Navy brig to a 10 by 12 foot cell and keep us in solid, American citizens, innocent American citizens, in solitary confinement for up to three years, making it difficult for us to see our families, to contact our lawyers, difficult to have charges filed, okay? That's what they did to Jose Padilla. Now, he was not so great, but they can do it to any one of us. Now, what psychiatrists know is that prolonged isolation, solitary confinement, makes healthy, sane people insane. So we're at this kind of incredibly fragile moment because democracies don't close down like that in a kind of steady progressive line. They closed down more in what Malcolm Gladwell would call a series of tipping points. And so, <clears throat> and then there reaches a point at which democracy can no longer heal democracy. But that point comes really fast when it comes. So the first time that the state made it legal to torture people, that was one of those vertical lines. And, you know, the first time that this kid was tasered in Florida, I think that was one of those vertical lines. I was not surprised to find that he was uh, tasered at the University of Florida. I know it's not appropriate for kids. I'm sorry. It's not. I know. I don't let my daughter listen. Um, I don't. It's like she has to watch America's Next Top Model in the, off the record. <laughs> the, the daughter of the beauty myth does watch America's Next Top Model, the beauty myth author. Um, but when, when, you know, when this kid was tasered, I wasn't surprised to learn, because I was reading Goebbels, that it took place at the University of Florida, which is answerable to the Board of Regents, which is answerable to the state legislature, which has close ties to Jeb Bush, 
because Goebbels pioneered this practice of using state legislatures to put pressure on state universities to jeopardize and put pressure on academics and students. But that was one of those vertical lines. And for me, you know, everyone in a closing society has their own boundary at which point they start to shut up. So I'm still talking to you in public, in this public place, and you're still here. I applaud you. For me personally, the day I open the New York Times and read that someone I identify with, an editor, a journalist, has been named an enemy combatant and is in solitary confinement, that's the day I'm not going to be talking to you anymore. Because at that point, I will be too scared. So that's how society closes down. And when, when these tipping points start to come thick and fast, it happens really quickly. So that is why we should worry about a secret prison system where torture takes place. The third thing that always happens when would-be despots are seeking to close an open society is that they create a paramilitary force. And what do you say to that? Who, who is that? That's right. That's exactly right. Now, you know, really think about it. You can't close down a democracy without a paramilitary force. You can't, because people are like, you know, I'm not going to be pushed around by you. But once you have a paramilitary force, you can send that paramilitary force to intimidate civilians. And then it doesn't matter if you've still got the you know, essential institutions of civil society functioning, because people are really just too intimidated to, to push back. This is what happened. Like People forget Italy was a democracy, a working parliamentary democracy, when Mussolini started to send what he called Arditi black shirts, uh, paramilitary guys, out to scare and intimidate civilians. You know, last summer in the Portland airport, people were asked by TSA officials, Transportation Security Administration officials, to drink baby formula and even human breast milk. Remember that? After the scare about the guy who was carrying liquids onto the plane. So this was a familiar scene to me. This was one of those echoes because um, Mussolini, the black shirts forced civilians to drink emetics like di um, laxatives at gunpoint, and, and this was so intimidating, it worked so well that Hitler imitated it, and the brown shirts forced people to drink gross liquids, and you know, this is a new scene for America, armed agents forcing people to drink gross liquids at gunpoint. Um, but when you, you know, look at Germany too, uh, you know, they weren't a majority party when the brown shirts were sent to intimidate civilians, to bully people, beat people. So right now, and by the way, the founders, like, why do we have the Second Amendment? Ugh, gosh, no, it just makes me crazy. It, this is what makes me crazy. We're, we're in an era when ordinary people feel separated from the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I did. You know, I have a good education, and I had to, like, sit a lawyer friend down. I mean, like, literally sit a lawyer friend down and say, okay, you have to explain to me what due process means. What is due process, like beginning to end? Because what is due process? Like, who knows exactly what due process is? And we're all really well educated. Notice an opportunity. Pardon me? Notice an opportunity. Notice an opportunity, that's right. So we're in a time when, like, this professional class of pundits and politicians and constitutional scholars are tasked or task themselves with worrying about the Constitution, worrying about liberty. And we're told, don't worry about it. You know, it's not your business. So I didn't even know how the Second Amendment worked or why it protected me until I did this reading. And the founders knew the danger that a paramilitary force poses to civilians because King George's men were wandering around bullying colonists, breaking into their homes. This is why a blanket warrant is such a big deal. They would have a blanket warrant, just say, okay, fine, I can break into your home, take your stuff, the way the state took Brandon Mayfield's computer out of his home in Oregon, a yuppie, you know, like any of us. And, and I say that in quotation marks, but he was like a total mainstream American, innocent guy. They broke into his home, went through his kid's stuff, his stuff took his stuff. And the founders knew, you know, that these mercenaries were like harassing women, 
molesting women, scaring and intimidating civilians. So they said, you can't have a standing army that's not answerable to the people. So Blackwater is now in the news. It has close ties to the White House. Um, and, and Blackwater's in the news right now in Iraq for massacring 17 civilians two or three weeks ago. And they got a slap on the wrist. But what most Americans don't know is that Blackwater is already operating on Main Street, USA. They were invited by the Department of Homeland Security to patrol the streets of New Orleans in the wake of Katrina. And they just got a billion dollar contract to work more intimately in the United States. Their business plan calls for increased deployment in America in the event of a natural disaster or a public emergency. And the Defense Authorization Act of 2007 makes it easier for the president on his say-so alone to declare a public emergency, because he says there's a public emergency. Not only that, but a new law has made it easier for the president to declare martial law by federalizing the National Guard. Now, the National Guard is supposed to be answerable to the people, to governors, right? The president can now take the National Guard of Alabama and send them here to Washington state and deploy them to enact curfew and martial law here, here in Washington state over the objections of the governors of Alabama and Washington state and not tell Congress about it till after the fact. So this is exactly what the founders were trying to go, no, no, you can't do this. This is a, this is a catastrophe. The fourth thing, and then I'll just zip ahead because these are, you know, hard to absorb. The fourth thing that a would-be dictator always does is to create a surveillance apparatus aimed at ordinary citizens. Now, you know, it doesn't take much for this kind of surveillance apparatus to be effective. In East Germany, everyone thought they had a Stasi file, but only 10% of the people actually did turn out to have a Stasi file. You don't need to surveil everyone in order, if everyone thinks they're being surveilled, that's inhibiting. Why is this so, like, personally freaking out to me, this surveillance? And by the way, this is driven by a profit motive. You know, America isn't driven by ideologies the way that Italy or Germany were. But America is driven by profit very often, and it's quite extraordinary. When the Berlin Wall fell, the third of the U.S. economy that is defense manufacturing was facing a declining market share because we lost our global enemy. And what do you have to do if you're losing a global enemy and you're a defense, the defense industry? Make a new enemy, exactly. They, they were looking at a real economic catastrophe unless they could hype a new enemy, enter the global war on terror. And what happened was that these weapons manufacturers who used to make Cold War weapons shifted their manufacturing to what's called the security industrial complex technologies, surveillance and security. And they have lobbyists, and their lobbyists work closely with Homeland Security. And it's this, again, multi-billion dollar industry. And so the best way to make sure that you're going to have continued profits is not just to hype a, a, a you know, relatively minor enemy, you know, serious but minor, um, the way that England and Spain sees the terror threat as serious but not a global war, right? They've, Gordon Brown has said it's a crime, not a cause. It's not a global war. The way you make sure to generate profit is to, to be sure that, you, the, that the enemy you create is us, that we are the enemy in need of surveillance. So why is this so... Why is this so uh, personal for me? For about a year and a half, every time I got on a plane, are you guys okay? Yeah. yeah. No, I always ask this at this point in the talk because, <laughs> you know, it's a lot. Um, but I do admire Americans because they're like, we, you know, we can handle it. Um, no, seriously. I sometimes feel overwhelmed by this stuff. I often do. Well, for a year and a half, every time I got on a plane, I would get a quadruple S, high risk security threat symbol on my boarding pass. Now, I'm a short Jewish girl from New York. 
and in, you know, in what way do I fit a global terrorist profile? The short Jewish girls with their credit cards rampaging through the globe, you know, <laughs> um, the big threat. But, um, uh, but, you know, I was always taken aside and given extra searching, and, and I kept asking, why, why are you doing this, why? Finally, a nice young woman on, from the TSA said, you're on the list. And I'm like, the list? I'm on the list? And her supervisor sort of hustled her away. <laughs> and I, you know, I did some research. I reported it out, and I was in very good company. Richard Murphy, the nation's foremost constitutional scholar who had just given a speech uh, he's a Princeton scholar, critical of Bush's assault on the Constitution, was on the list. Um, two nice little old ladies from San Francisco who run an anti-war newsletter called War Times are on the list. Uh, I just heard that one of the leaders of Code Pink, the anti-war group, was turned back from Canada. She's not allowed to cross the border, which is a classic fascist tactic of closing borders to critics and dissidents, she's on the list. Two staffers at the ACLU are on the list. One of the leaders of Greenpeace is on the list. I get these emails I can't bear to open. A, a decorated war hero started crying when I spoke to him two days ago when I was in Denver because you know, he'd flown all these combat missions. He was so brave, but he broke down when he was describing how not only is he on the list for having criticized the administration, his family's on the list. His 15-year-old child is on the list. So this is very bad because uh, you know, if you follow the Washington Post, you see that the level of surveillance that is now directed at us is at such a high level that when you get on a plane, they know what you're reading, who you're sitting next to, where you're going when you get off the plane, and what the phone number is of the person you're going to visit. It's gotten to the point where before I got into the line for security at LaGuardia, I realized I was carrying a copy of Tara McKelvey's book, Monstering, which is about CIA interrogations, and some of it is classified information, as all good reporting is based on classified information. And I, you know, threw it away, a $30 hardcover. Um, I put it in the garbage because, you know, I was too scared to go through security with it. Um, so it's very, very bad when there's a security apparatus aimed at ordinary citizens because you, you start by getting on the no-fly list or the watch list, but there are lists, and this is a classic fascist thing to do. They did it in Italy, they did it in Germany. You get on the list, and pretty soon welfare benefits, job opportunities close down if you're on the list. And other unpleasant things happen. When I got to Vermont, where I was copy editing this book, I had my computer inside my suitcase, and I got to my hotel room, and I unzipped my suitcase, and on top of my computer was a letter from Homeland Security in my suitcase. So it's not good. <laughs> so I'm going to just zip through some of the other steps. Um, the, the fifth thing you do in, a, in closing down an open society is arbitrarily detain and release citizens. Um, you infiltrate citizens' groups. The ACLU has many lawsuits against uh, the infiltration of ordinary groups here in Seattle, I'm sure anti-war groups, environmental groups, um, total non-terrorist groups are, if it's typical of the rest of the country, being infiltrated by police or intelligence agents um, who like dress like you or me. In fact, they're probably possibly here tonight. And no, seriously, hello. Um, yes, right? And uh, you infiltrate citizens' groups, and that's an important piece in breaking down democracy because then citizens don't have the trust level of working effectively together. Um, you target key individuals. I mean, there are some amazing examples of this. And again, I keep getting emails every day. Everyone from the JAG military lawyers, these patriotic lawyers, probably most of them Republicans, who were told to sell out their clients, the detainees, and refused to because they're lawyers. They're not allowed to do that. It would violate their oath. And th their careers were derailed. To Bill Maher, who said one thing, and pressure was put on CBS was it CBS, on his parent company to fire him, to Dan Rather, who just brought a $70 million lawsuit against Viacom for being ousted because of White House pressure. Um, this is, again, a, a Goebbels tactic that you target key individuals, people in the press, academics, people in the media, performers, um, so, you know, the Dixie Chicks, so that people see that you crash and burn or there are repercussions if you stand up. You restrict the press. Um, 
is the next step. And the classic example of this is, remember the swift banking story when the New York Times under executive editor Bill Keller reported this classified program that the White House was following banking, financial records. So there was this drumbeat from the White House, treason, 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 right? They should be prosecuted under the Espionage Act. And Melanie Morgan actually said, called for um, a prosecution for treason, and one of the consequences of a conviction for treason is execution. And she's like, whatever, it's fine. So this was really scary to me because I was reading, you know, in a strong democracy, that's just hype, that's just language, it's just like, oh God, they're at it again, you know, the right wing. But in a weakening democracy, it starts to get not so funny. And really not funny when you're reading Stalin and you find out that in 1937, Nikolai Bukharin, who actually was the publisher of Izvestia, which was the equivalent of the New York Times for Russia at that time, was charged with treason and actually executed in the third Moscow show trial. And this espionage, espionage, what happens in a closing society is there starts to be a drumbeat of words like terrorist, enemy of the people, sabotage, espionage, treason. And the definition of terrorist or traitor or spy starts to expand and expand entangling more and more people, more and more criminalization of speech. So, for instance, the blueprint is so predictive. Um, because of what I know about the blueprint, I could tell when a law was passed last fall, expanding the definition of terrorist to include animal rights activists, I knew, yeah, I knew that within about six months, people who looked like the boy or girl next door would be called terrorists and prosecuted. And that's exactly what happened by about March, about six months later. By the same token, you know, we were talking about the blurring of the line and how predictive it is. You know from history that the first people to be tried under the Military Commissions Act are likely to be white and English speaking. And in fact, David Hicks, a white English speaking prisoner, was among the first to be tried by the military commissions. It's so predictive that the tasering of this kid happened right, you know, like according to the clock. So, you know, there was this drumbeat espionage, espionage, you know, th there was this drumbeat to uh, charge people who released or revealed classified information with the 1917 Espionage Act. This sounds sensible, we're at war, you don't want spies, but the history of the Espionage Act, oi, you know, and I didn't know this until I read about it. The Espionage Act was last used during the drumbeat running up to the Great War, the First World War. And it was used to round up people like us, again, critics, anti-war activists, journalists, people who were fighting child labor with, without warrants, um, mass arrests, people were beaten, and Eugene Debs got a 10-year sentence under the Espionage Act for giving a speech about the Constitution. And the Espionage Act arrests quieted dissent in this country for a decade. So it is not a happy thing, the uh, invocation of the Espionage Act against Bill Keller. And, you know, and there are other examples of horrible things happening to journalists. Um, Greg Pallast, who wrote Armed Madhouse, was investigated by Homeland Security. And staffers for Associated Press and CBS have actually been seized in Iraq because the U.S. didn't like the images and stories they were producing. And, you know, they were held without charges in abusive U.S.-held prisons. So it's very bad. And the last two things you do in a fascist shift, when you're closing down an open society, I mentioned you recast criticism as espionage and dissent as treason. Remember, Hillary Clinton was called a traitor for, for criticizing the deployment of the war. And the last thing that happens is that you subvert the rule of law or simply declare martial law. And in the run-up to the election, you know, according to the historical blueprint, the months before an election are a very unstable time, most likely to see acts of provocation, hyped threats, um, destabilizing scenes where like there will be a protest and agents provocateurs will uh, provoke violence or engage in violence to give an excuse for a crackdown. But more sort of um, routinely, at the end of my argument, I play out a series of what ifs for this last point in a, cla in a classic fascist shift, which God willing, we're not gonna get to because we're all gonna rise up 
right now and save the country. Um, we are. But what is more likely to happen is something more subtle. Remember the U.S. attorney scandal? Okay, so when I first heard about it, I was reading Goebbels. He was so brilliant. And, you know, I said, I bet those attorneys were in swing states. And it's not that I'm that smart, it's that I know the blueprint. And, in fact, they were in swing states. And, in fact, the emails that the White House is not turning over to Congress will show that one of the scenarios they were playing around with was firing all of the U.S. attorneys all at once in a kind of mass purge, Night of the Long Knives. So had they done that, and they would have gotten away with it if a blogger hadn't sounded the alarm, we would already be looking at the end of America because the U.S. attorneys decide to prosecute voting rights groups, for instance, and in a close election, if your cronies are the ones making the decisions, it's pretty much over, even without a coup, a violent coup. And we have this, like, wrong notion of what a closed society looks like. A closed society doesn't look like marching, goose-stepping columns or crematory in the distance. It almost never looks like that. Once in history, it looked like that. A closed society, even a violent military dictatorship, really looks, has a lot of the trappings of civil society. There are still elections. They're just corrupted. Tyrants love holding elections. It validates them. Hitler held elections. 99% of the Austrians voted ya yeah to their own annexation because there were brown shirts outside the voting booth menacing the people who were counting the vote. Do you guys remember the reports of Republican staffers, young men dressed identically, menacing people counting the vote in Florida? There are still elections in a closed society. They're just corrupted. There's a changing of the guard. It's just, and Giuliani is clearly the designated successor. It's, but it's the same cabal in power, essentially. Um, there's still a judiciary in a closed society. They're just not free to adjudicate freely and go against the regime. There's still academics. They're just watching what they say. There's still newspapers. You just know exactly how far to, to push an inquiry. So at the end of this scenario, there are a series of what-ifs that are very plausible to close down our society further leading up to the election. So now I've completely bummed you out. So now I'm going to shift to what we can do and what we have to do. I mean, this is a really important moment because the window is closing, but history shows that at a moment like this, if millions of people wake up in time and push back, they can push democracy forward and unseat tyrants. And there are amazing inspirational stories that are evidence of this in the democracy movements that brought down the Berlin Wall, people power in the Philippines, um, all over the world, when millions of people push back, they can unseat tyrants, especially in a weakened democracy like ours that is still not closed. But it takes a democracy movement right now. We have no time to waste. It takes millions of people rising up and insisting on restoring the rule of law. Now, when I first started talking about these issues, I thought we could do it legislatively alone. And a few other leaders, or a few leaders and myself, um, started what is called the American Freedom Campaign, which is a grassroots democracy movement aimed at confronting these abuses and restoring democracy in time to save us. And we started out with nothing, and now we have almost 5 million members in our various partner organizations. And we're aiming at 10 or 20 million. And we got commitments from all the candidates to restore the Constitution. All the candidates on the Democratic side, Hillary and Obama, were the last holdouts, but they just signed or gave language. And now we're going to the Republicans. Only Ron Paul has signed right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. But this is not enough, I now realize. The violence is escalating. You know, the thing about a fascist shift is that when people start to wake up, that's when they start to crack down harder. And I'm very worried about these reports of massacres in Iraq. Very, very worried, reading today that the State Department is protecting uh, Blackwater in Iraq from being investigated. And I'm very worried about these tasering scenes and scenes of people being pepper sprayed and scenes of women being dragged away in the Phoenix airport that keep showing up on AOL in eerily good video. Because, you know, 
again, National Socialists created a lot of footage of atrocities early on to freak people out and intimidate them. So what I'm saying is we need to ratchet up our efforts even as they ratchet up the violence or the suppression. And now at this point, I am persuaded by the historical record that a national uprising to restore democracy is incredibly urgent, but that it's going to take more than that. And I never thought I'd say this. I didn't think impeachment was a good idea when I began this journey because it's so destabilizing. But what we're faced with if we don't is so much more destabilizing. There is no, I think there's no alternative. And history shows that it's not enough to impeach criminals and murderers, that you have to put them behind bars. So I think we need to prosecute for treason. <laughs> So I will end this by saying that if we all take on the Patriots' task, and it begins with a revolution, as Gloria Steinem would say, from within, there is every reason to believe we can save our country in time and restore liberty to our neighbors and our children and ourselves. But what it takes, I want to send you home tonight with a completely different idea of what your job is than you might have thought. The founders did not intend for us to delegate the defense of liberty to a professional class of pundits or politicians or constitutional scholars. That's right. That's right. The founders intended for us to do it. Now, their vision wasn't wide enough yet to include all of us. But the kernel of their vision was sound enough so that it could include women and African Americans, people of all colors, as time went on. And what the founders intended was for ordinary Americans, ordinary people, to assume the Patriots' task and lead the fight to restore democracy and, and, and see themselves as leaders and take on the responsibility to restore liberty. It's a radically different idea of what our job is. Okay, It's your job. It's my job to channel the Founder's faith in us and to stand up for this extraordinary experiment that has given us freedom for 200 years. And if we assume the Patriot's task, can give our children and our grandchildren freedom indefinitely. But we have to believe in our power in order to do that. The time to stand up for it is now. Thank you very much. <laughs>